Praise the Lord. We want to welcome our national, international office or audience this morning to church. Pray that you're blessed. Would you stand for the reading of the word? Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. For Samuel chapter 17, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephesodimum. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on one side on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath Goliath of Gath who had whose height was six cubits in a span he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass He had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and you service to Saul? Choose you a man for you. Let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I ask you to anoint me with the power of the fire of the Holy Ghost to preach this your eternal word that you have given to me for this time. I pray, Father, Lord, to anoint every ear and every heart that is under the sound of my voice that will be receptive to, and good seed would fall on good ground. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, musicians. Thank you so much. The title of the message I would like to share with you for the next few moments is Just Another Day. Just Another Day. It appears that the one thing we know for certain is that we do not know what the enemy is preparing against us. He is continually seeking for something that will cause us to stumble and fall. So he listens to you speak. He watches you, he watches your deeds, your actions, your impulses. He is looking and he is waiting for something he can use to tear you down. It was just another day of battle. This day was like most other days for Israel. Another day to be fought. Israel had been fighting... Since its very existence, enemy after enemy, the same enemy many times over and over and over again. But on this particular occasion, they were about to fight the Philistines. Once again, they would face each other, and the tone of the scripture seemed to be nonchalant. It's just another day. We're going to fight the Philistines just another day, just another time. The Philistines, as I read to you, were on one side of the valley, and Israel was on the other side of the valley, and the valley was between, and they would meet in the valley, and there they would fight. So here we go again. Another day, another battle, another fight. One more time, they were going to fight each other. Some would be wounded, and some would die. But it was just another day to do battle. The army of Israel was special. They knew they were special. They knew they were special because they were serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was not about them. 
It was about the God they served. Now the enemies of Israel knew that Israel was special. There's been a lot on the news this past week about Israel and last week. All kind of riots going on over there. And a lot of people don't know it, but a teenager, when a, a teenager gets to a certain age, the boys and the girls must serve time in the army. Male and female makes no difference. They all got to serve, I think it's three years in the military. The Philistines knew that Israel was inspired. They knew that Israel was anointed. They knew that they could not defeat Israel. They knew they couldn't defeat Israel. The devil knows he cannot defeat the people of God. No doubt they began to plan the scheme. What can we do to cause Israel to fail? What can we do to defeat Israel? What could they do? So they come up with a, with a plan. They came up with a cause. They, they came up with a cause of how they could cause Israel to be defeated. If they could cause Israel to doubt God, they knew that they could defeat Israel. The ultimate plan was decided. Get the biggest giant that you can find and we'll have him fight for us. They chose Goliath. Goliath came out on the battlefield. His weapons alone and his attire alone weighed 318 pounds. That's more than most people weigh. So they got Goliath and they made a deal with Goliath. And now they have a secret weapon that a man called Goliath. The Bible says and history says that he was a giant among giants. He wasn't just a giant. He was a giant to the giants. And the Bible says what could be done. It was just another battle. And they said, hey, we're just going to have another fight. But today, it was not just another battle. It was anything but that. What should have been just another day was anything but that. It was not just another day. As they prepared to walk out onto the battlefield, the giant Goliath walked out and they saw him and they were terrified. They saw this great giant come out there and he said, send me out a man to fight for me. And the Bible said they fled, but not did it was one or two, but all of them fled and they hid. They were stunned. How could anybody fight this giant? Who could fight this giant? The most astounding thing to me is the fact that Goliath walked out there by himself all alone and he stood there and he charged and he called out to the armies of Israel. What an impact it made upon the armies of Israel. They were terrified. So a question comes this morning. Are you facing giants in your life? We all know that we're in a war. We all know that we're in a war and we have to fight every single day of our existence. But we expect it. We know that when the Lord saved us and we became part of the family of God, that there's a war going on and we got to fight every single day. And we expect it. But let me tell you something this morning. The fact that you are still in the fight signifies that you're winning. The fact that you're even in the fight signifies the fact that you're winning. You have not been defeated. But may I tell you this morning that the enemy's getting tired of losing. He's getting tired of being defeated. So he's planning and he's scheming of ways to defeat you. And he knows from past experience that his greatest weapon is doubt. If he can get the people of God to doubt God, that's the greatest weapon he has. So he searches for a giant in your life. And he finds one. And when you think it's just another fight, out steps the giant. So what is the giant? The giant in our life, the giant in your life today is an issue of your past. 
I want to tell you, God don't remember your past when he saved you. The Bible said he cast your sins into the sea of forgetfulness far behind him. As far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. God don't know it, but you know it. So it's an issue from your past that the devil brings up. A weakness, a temptation that's not been covered by the blood. You may have told a lie or there may be hatred in your heart or prejudice or jealousy or anger or an unconfessed sin that's in your life and the devil knows everything. You may be lukewarm, playing with seducing spirits. The devil understands. So you hide and you hope that this will pass. You just hope, well, maybe if I hide, he'll go on. When I was a little child, I remember my mother was in the Iron Inn, and I'd watched a movie on television. That was back in the days of black and white, for all of you that don't remember that. And it was an Army movie. And the best I remember, I think it was Iwo Jima, and, and just as fast as they got off those, whatever they call them, containers, bringing them from the ships, they were cut down. They were shot. They were dead. And I went out to them. I said, Mother, I wonder why they don't just play dead. She said, Son, if they play dead, who's going to fight? I never forgot that. That's been, over, that's been over 60 years ago. I never forgot that. You can't play dead. You can't hide from your enemy. But this giant's not giving up. This giant must be dealt with. You must kill this giant before this giant kills you. You need to understand that something or someone is going to die. You must understand something or someone is going to die. You or your giant. So what will you do? You need to understand Ephesians 6 says the battlefield's the mind. You'll be driving down the road and you're as happy as you can be. <laughs> and driving down the road and you begin to grip that steering wheel. And before you get a half mile, you're mad at everybody in the world. And they, there's nobody there. There's no, it's a battle of the mind. Your mind gets to work in your mind and the thoughts of the mind and, and the different and you begin to get mad at everybody in the world and nobody's done anything to you. The battlefield is in the mind. You've got to face this giant. You've got to slay this giant. You say, well, how? How, Pastor? How, how, how am I going to kill this giant that keeps rearing up his head? And every time I think I'm going on for God, I get closer to God. The devil rears his head up. And I got to deal with the same situation again and again and again. How am I going to defeat the devil? I'm going to tell you how. Tell a terrible preacher, I won't tell you how to do something. Remember, remember, remember who you are. Remember whose you are. You're not an ordinary person. Now, I know that you're just a hillbilly from Paulding County, but to God, you're not. You're, you're not an ordinary person. You're a child of God. You belong to God. And nothing can get to you unless God allows it. You got to remember where you came from. I remember where I came from. I was talking to a young preacher the other day, and I remember several years ago, and if he was anywhere, he was an evangelist. If he was anywhere in the area, I'd go and I would 
be in the service with him to help support him. And he was running a revival in Alpharetta. So me and Sister Graham, we drove over there to be in service with him. And the night before, a young lady had gotten saved, and she had, she had been on drugs and prostitution and all kinds of awful, terrible things, but she got gloriously saved. And so the next night, we were there, and we were sitting there, and, and he, he got up to preach, and he said, you know, I, I don't have a testimony like the, the young lady that got saved last night. I've never tasted alcohol. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never said a cuss word. I've been raised in church all of my life. I don't have a testimony like she did. After church, I said, come here, son. Come here. And we went back to the back of the church, and I said, let, let, let me tell you something. Don't you ever say you don't have a testimony again. And if I hear of it, son, I'm going to kick your behind. And I said, don't you ever say that again. You got the greatest testimony of all that God has been faithful. Hallelujah. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Remember where you came from. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Hallelujah. I didn't know God then, but I know God now. I didn't feel his presence then, but I feel his glory now. Hallelujah. Remember where you came from. Remember what God's already done in your life. Remember, the battle's not yours. The battle belongs to God. Remember this morning, he'll not leave you. He said, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I will, Paul said, and added to it, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You got to remember, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit self. The Lord of hosts. You need to remember the greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. I saw this. Uh, <coughs> this little picture the other day. I don't remember where I saw it. But it was a little cat. A little kitty. You know what I'm talking about? A kitty. A little kitty. And he was drinking, getting a drink of water. But the picture in the water was a lie. I want to remind you, the devil don't see you. He sees he that's in you. And if we could ever understand that we're not standing in our might or our power, but we are standing in the might of the great God Jehovah. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And you need to remember that you're going through. Jesus never did anything halfway. David said in Psalms 23, he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil. I'm not going to stay in this valley. I'm going to walk through this valley. You need to remember that Jesus is your intercessor. He's your great high priest. You need to remember that the enemy has nothing but a spirit and sword, but you come in the name of the Lord. These are things you need to remember. You need to remember that you are chosen. You need to remember that you're anointed by the Holy Ghost. You need to remember that you're a child of the King. You need to remember the best is yet to come. Heaven's going to be worth the journey. You need to remember that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. I'm going to tell you that you can conquer the spirit of doubt. Look at David. And David was a young man. And the king says, what? You're just a kid. He's a man of war. But what King Saul failed to remember was David was serving God. But David remembered what God had already done in his life, even though he was young. He didn't have anything but faith in God. That's all he had. The Bible said that he walked out, he had a, 
he had a bag for stones. He had a sling. He went down to the brook, and he got five smooth stones. He put them in his bag. He got one. That's all he had. Goliath had 318 pounds of weapons. And Goliath had a helmet of brass in his. It was, it was just open, you know, just so he could see. But David said, you come to me with spear and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he whipped out that stone and got it right between the eyes. But I want you to understand this morning Goliath was not dead. He was knocked down, but he was not dead. David ran and took Goliath's sword and cut off his head. He had no weapons. The only thing he had was what he kept always when he tended his father's sheep. And he had faith in God. We must win this battle today. Our world is in a mess. I'm not going to get political. I wish I could. But everybody don't vote like I do. Everybody don't see things like I do because they don't read the Word of God. Did you hear the survey this, this week on the news? It said that patriotism was down to 38%. Did you hear that religion was down to 39 of importance, 39%? Having children was 30% being involved in the community or different things was down to 27%. Listen, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Our world is collapsing around us. Our nation, unless God intervenes, is collapsing around us. And we tend to let fear and doubt grip our hearts. I want to remind you what the word said. It's going to have to get bad before he comes. And I'm looking for him to come any time. But we got to win this battle. Just another day. It's not just another day. If the church don't stand up and start fighting, going to be defeated we're going to have to go down to, to what's referred to as an underground church God's church will never be defeated someone asked me they said pastor the great falling away said there's not there's going to be empty churches everywhere there's going, I said no that's not what the scripture says Churches are going to be bigger. They're building them bigger now. They've got a message that is not the gospel. Churches are going to be everywhere, but the church, the true church. Now, I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about believers. They're going to have to go underground or somewhere I remember when I was uh, when China went communist and they drove all the missionaries and all the churches out of China and it was about 30 years or longer I forget how long it was it might have been 70 years I don't, I don't recall but when, China, when communism finally fell And they started allowing missionaries back in and they were afraid there were going to be no Christians left because of the persecution. They sent back 
reports and they said we found a few hundred and then they found send back reports said we found a few thousand and then they sent back reports that said we found several million God's church is not going to die regardless of what happens God's church is not going to die So we must stand up and fight. There's great persecution against Christianity today. And the devil's trying his best to get you to allow doubt in your mind and in your heart to cause you to back up on God. But you're facing a giant and you got to kill the giant. I've been to foreign countries to preach and they would gather me people would gather together and they would bring me in Sister Graham was with me and there was just enough room I mean I could turn I could touch people all around me that were this close just wanting to hear the gospel. There's a hunger in the world. And we that have been blessed greater than anyone in the world are allowing giants to arise in our lives. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like how the preacher preaches. I don't like the songs the choir sings. I... I don't like the air conditioning, it's too hot, it's too cold. I don't like the way the greeters greet me. It's not about what you like, it's about God. And if you'll get your mind on God, everything else will work out. Would you stand? Father, I thank you for this opportunity this morning to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray now, Lord, that you'd touch the hearts of everybody, of all people that are gathered here, those that are under the sound of my voice. Father, Lord, I thank you and praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you are here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, I invite you to come. The greatest thing that you will ever do is when he knocks on your heart's door that you will open the door. I want to say this, and especially to all those around the world that listen to our program. You don't just decide that you're going to get saved. You've got to be convicted by the Holy Ghost. Drawn by the Spirit. And when he draws you, you need to respond I thought I was a happy person until I met the Lord. I thought I loved my wife and children until I met the Lord because I didn't even know what love was. I knew what the worldly love was. I didn't know what godly love was until I met him. I've never met a person, never one, not one that has ever said to me, What they have said is, when God saved me, my entire life changed, and I wish I'd gotten saved before. If that's you this morning, I invite you to come. I'm not going to prolong it. All right then. If you need prayer for any reason, if you'll come, I'll be happy to pray for you. Just come and stand right here. I won't pray that I don't pray long prayers. It's not the length of the prayer that I pray. It's the giver. Here's the prayer. If that's you, I'll pray for you. Otherwise, we're going to be dismissed. Oh, hallelujah.
pray for Brother Corey.